Hello and welcome. We're going to be talking about social emotional learning today and digital citizenship in a distance learning environment. My name is Tali Horowitz. I'm the education director in New York um, and a former elementary school and special education teacher. And I'm joined by the wonderful Barbara Hugh, who um, works in the DC area and is a former high school science teacher. We are from Common Sense. Um, Common Sense is a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping kids and educators and families thrive in our digital world. And we do this through three different ways, through ratings and reviews, education and advocacy. And as we jump into today's presentation, we're gonna be talking about social emotional learning. And it's really important to first check in with ourselves and think about how we're all feeling and you know what we're bringing to this day. Um, and so I'd like to ask you to take a moment and just reflect on what, um, what you're feeling. And you can go ahead and put in the chat, which of these emojis best describes how you're feeling. And as you're putting that in, I'm gonna ask Barbara, Barbara, how are you feeling? Which of these emojis describes you? Thanks, Tali. Um, I feel like I'm at a one today. You know, it's Wednesday and I feel like, you know, I've made it through uh, most of the week and I'm feeling pretty good uh, about the rest of the week. So thanks for asking. How about you? That's fantastic. I'm, I'm at a one too. I might even be a little bit at a two. Um, I, I do also want to clear up for our, our viewers. I'm not actually underwater. This is a background, but I enjoy having that and that helps set me into a a calm state as well. And I'm really appreciating everyone in the chat who's jumping in and, and sharing how they're feeling. It looks like we've got a lot of folks feeling good today. Um, so thanks for kind of setting that up. And now let's think a little bit about how our students are feeling. So Common Sense um, does quite a bit of research. And we did this recent study looking at how tweens and teens were interacting with the digital world since the pandemic. And a few of the key findings that came out were, number one, a lot of young people, not surprisingly, are really concerned about the pandemic and the impact on their families. A lot of kids are also feeling lonely. And a lot of them are also using the digital world to connect with their peers and their friends. And so that's been helpful from that respect. And I think, you know, even prior to the pandemic, there's always been a lot of digital stressors out there, you know, thinking about that kind of pressure to respond. When is it appropriate? How quickly do I have to respond? Um, and I think the pandemic has heightened it. We just had a meeting recently with our teen council and some of the teens were saying that um, they're fully remote. And now when they get an email from their teacher, they feel like they have to respond immediately and that they've been feeling kind of, um, that it's been hard, the lines between school time and home time have been really blurred. And I know that certainly resonates for me and Barbara, I'm imagining for you as well and a lot of us. So I'd like everyone to kind of take a moment to think about what types of digital stressors do you think your students are facing right now? And this is really gonna ground our conversation as we think about supporting them. And as people are sharing in the chat, Barbara, what have you been seeing or, or what do you think is coming up for students today? I think what's coming up for students is coming up for us as adults as well, like just the blending between, you know, our work and our home environments, you know, there's not really a time where we used to go like, you know, ride the bus or have a commute to work. And now we're just kind of going from class to class or meeting to meeting um, and just kind of balancing, you know, our personal lives versus our school or work lives has really, you know, it's just been a challenge as yeah. well. And, and um, I thank you for those of you sharing in the chat. I'm just gonna share a couple of comments. Um, some are really struggling with that feeling of isolation while also having to be online all the time. And so that's kind of conflicting. And then just in general, finding any type of balance too. Um, so thanks so much, as well as um, the, the lack of motivation. Yeah, cause that not having that in-person kind of feedback. Absolutely, thank you. So if we, if we take a look at thinking about all of you know these digital stressors really the goal for today is thinking about how can we support our students to navigate these stressors to navigate the digital dilemmas that they're facing um, so we're just going to briefly outline our goals for the next 45 minutes or so so we're going to walk through a digital dilemma our students may be facing and we're going to really look deeply at some of the thinking routines 
Then we're gonna explore activities that reinforce media balance and connecting with others that are two key strategies for addressing social emotional learning. And then we're gonna end with um, jumping into some activities that encourage self-reflection and perspective taking, which again are key to the social emotional well-being. Great, thanks, Holly. And we're gonna try to make this as interactive as we can. So um, if you're joining us today, just feel free to uh, share responses and thoughts in the chat. Thanks. And everything that we're gonna be looking at today is from Common Sense's free K through 12th grade digital citizenship curriculum. And I think we're gonna pause for a moment and look at it, but on the screen in front of you, you'll see these are the six different topic areas. And Barbara, if you don't mind um, clicking on that, and we'll, we'll put this link in the chat as well. We're just gonna show you really quickly what the curriculum looks like. If you haven't registered, um, to access our free resources, please go ahead and do that. You'll be prompted to register. This is completely free and we don't sell your data. It's, it's so we know how many people are using our resources. So you'll see there's all these different topic areas and you can filter by these specific topic areas or you can follow our general scope and sequence. Starting at third grade, we have six lessons per grade level, each following one of these topics. For K1 and two, it's, it's three lessons. And each of the lessons is approximately 45 minutes. There's, um, they're all integratable into Google Slides um, and Google Classroom. And there's always a family engagement activity um, and a check for understanding. So we'll give you some time to explore later, but I see Barbara highlighting there all the different components for what you can see. Great, thanks so much, Tali. And actually um, in second grade, we start off with six lessons. So oh. there are, Lots of lessons, just kindergarten and first grade are three lessons each. So we're gonna be showing some examples from our curriculum today. And we're really looking at some of these we statements as well within our topic. So you're gonna see those come up again um, as we're navigating through. Mm -hmm. And the curriculum, which was heavily researched and designed in partnership with the Harvard School of Education is really founded on this um, social emotional learning framework. So we think about it in terms of these rings of responsibility. First, starting with the self. So we started this workshop today with asking you to reflect on how you're feeling and then thinking about your extended community. So this is friends and families, classmates, thinking about how they're thinking and feeling and being able to respond appropriately. And then of course, the broader community in the wider world. And then also key to the curriculum is having these skills and habits of mind. So we think about these in terms of dispositions as well. So really asking students repeatedly to slow down and reflect, how is this making you feel? How might this be making other people feel? Looking for different types of facts and evidence, thinking about other perspectives. So if I look at one post, it might have one opinion, but can I find some other views or other things? And then really this envisioning options, which we'll spend some time talking about. You know, it's very um, core to, to adolescent development is this idea of whatever I'm feeling right now is how I'm gonna feel forever. And what we wanna really help young people do is think about looking at other possibilities. Okay, things might feel tough right now, but what are some options I have? And then what actions can I take? Great. And Diving right in, we're going to actually look at one of our lessons, and this is a lesson that is actually a high school lesson, but I think that many of our students, regardless of the grade level, and even adults, right, we probably have experienced a similar situation. Um, so we can really empathize with our students as they're going through this scenario. So we are going to take a look at a dilemma that our kids may be facing or could face in the future. And I'm going to have Tali start us off with this dilemma. Jason's classmate, Tim, had started texting Jason a lot every day. Jason and Tim were friendly and Jason had always liked him. At first, Jason was happy to be talking to Tim out of school, but Tim was having a hard time. Tim's parents were fighting a lot and Tim's life at home had gotten really stressful. Jason wanted to be kind and supportive and always tried to be there when Tim texted. Perfect. Recently, the texting had become overwhelming for Jason. Jason cared about Tim and didn't want to make his situation any worse by not being a good friend. Jason was also worried about Tim's mental health. At the same time, the texting felt burdensome and was starting to take a toll. Jason thought he needed to set some boundaries, but he wasn't sure how 
and didn't want to make things harder for Tim. So how many of you have experienced a scenario like this? If you have, go ahead and yeah, right? Um, and add it into the chat. And what we're gonna do now is think and look at a thinking routine that will help our students process a dilemma like this um, and really think about how they're feeling and also giving them agency to know that they have options, right? When they're presented with these scenarios. So we're gonna look at a thinking routine called feelings and options. And this is in this lesson and it's um, woven into many of our other lessons as well. And this feelings and options thinking routine has four phases. So you're gonna see that students are going to identify, right? Who are the different people involved in the scenario? Like, what is it about? Um, then they're gonna look at their feelings, right? What do you think each person in the dilemma is feeling? So this is really having them take some, you know, perspective taking on how someone else might be feeling in a scenario. Then they're going, I'm sorry, go ahead, Tally. Oh, no, I was going to say, if that's okay, Barbara, I was just going to jump in and share that um, I actually had the opportunity to do this dilemma today with a seventh grade class. So this lesson was designed for high school. But again, as Barbara was saying, this applies in so many different scenarios. And what was interesting is when it came to the feel part, one of the students, um, she immediately said, oh, I can relate to this so much. And the way she identified the dilemma was that both students um, were really struggling and keeping secrets from each other, which didn't jump out to me. And But it was really illuminating in terms of that's something that she's dealing with. And then we were able to have a conversation about that and her, and her peers were able to support her too. Great, thanks Tali um, for sharing. So in, if you have any other examples of maybe how students might be feeling or what you're identifying in this scenario, please feel free to share in the chat as well. Um, and then after we the students like kind of think about the first two, they're then going to imagine options that the situation could be handled. And this could also be done independently and then having like a group discussion about how might this, you know, be handled and what is like, um, what are some ways that uh, the situation can be handled where there's the most positive in, you know, outcome that would be happening. And then students will then practice like how they would talk to a person if they were presented with a, a similar scenario. So really working through those like social emotional skills, um, but also those dispositions or habits of mind that our digital citizenship curriculum um, incorporates. So for example, just to bring it back to what Tali was talking about earlier today, um, each one of these steps will build those habits of mind um, and have students practice those habits of mind. So as they're identifying um, who's in the scenario, they're slowing down. And then as they're considering feelings of others, they're exploring different perspectives. And then as they're imagining, they're envisioning options and impacts. And finally, um, as they're practicing what they would say, not only are they envisioning options and impacts, but they're also taking action, right? And going and having the tools ready to take action so that they're not, you know, feeling the heaviness of the situation, right? They're getting that agency. And so I just wanted to see what would you hope your students would take away from an activity like this? So if you had your students participate in this kind of scenario, what would you hope that they would take away? So if you could share in the chat, and Tali, uh, do yeah, you have anything? We're already getting some great responses. So, you know, I think slowing down is such an important step someone was sharing. Um, someone else shared really that ability to be able to know how others are feeling and think about it, to know that you don't have to be stuck, to build empathy. Great. And we actually have some responses from students. And so these are some of the takeaways that students um, had from this activity, right? Just being able to express your feelings, um, being tolerant and kind, right? Having empathy for someone else's situation. Um, being able to evaluate other people's feelings, like read their feelings, right? Um, is really helpful too. And then I thought this one was really interesting, right? I would be able to 
um, you know, if my friends were in a similar situation, I would be able to look at this and maybe figure out who to go to first, right, and help first mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, this is great. And and some other some other great feedback in the chat was wanting students to feel heard, to know they have options and people to help them out, as well as um, to help students be non judgmental. Yes. So moving forward, what are some strategies that can help support emotional well-being with our students? How can we incorporate some of these strategies at home and then also in our classes? Yeah, and we have a whole topic strand focused on media balance and well-being um, that really highlights all of this. Uh, starting in kindergarten, um, we have a lesson that we're highlighting right now, which focuses on transitions and recognizing your feelings when you're transitioning off of technology. If you happen to live in my house, that might look like screaming and saying, I hate the transitions, but the whole idea is we're helping kids start to get in touch with those feelings at, at the earliest possible ages. Um, moving up into middle school, we have uh, students start thinking about what balance means for them and how they feel during uh, digital activities, both during and after, for example, how do they feel after scrolling on Instagram for a few hours? What does balance look like for them? And we're really working on building those self-regulation and, and agency skills. And then in high school, um, we're even further building off of that middle school kind of platform and thinking more deeply about their online behavior. So students are reflecting on the difference in how they feel with active, versus passive social media use and how this manifests with different feelings as well. And with that, we're going to dive into an example. So the example um, is from a quick activity. So before Barbara and I were sharing our scope and sequence with all of our lessons that are about 45 minutes in length, we've also developed these quick activities that are typically about 15 minutes in length, and they're all structured around a video and corresponding discussion. And these are especially good, I would say, in our distance learning environment. So if you're in a hybrid or a remote classroom, these are great for asynchronous lessons too. So we're not gonna show the video right now, but really what we do is we show a video where kids are looking at interacting with each other. Um, and then we ask them to reflect on balance. And so what we'd like to do right now is ask all of you to reflect on what strategies you encourage for media balance. So this could be both what strategies you have for yourselves personally, what strategies you might talk about with your students. So take a minute to think about this. Oh, and I love that there's already people jumping in in the chat. Um, I see ones about turning off notifications, which is fantastic. I think Barbara, you have some great tips with that. What do, what do you do before bed? I think you said you but I'm do not yeah, so before I go to bed, I actually turn my phone on to do not disturb and you can set it so that do not disturb comes on every night. So you don't even have to re like remember to do it. So like at 10 PM, my phone will no longer um, notify me if someone texts me or if I get, you know, a message on Facebook or something like that. So it's really great for me just to wind down and then actually go to bed um, mm -hmm. by turning off those notifications. And I love this, someone in the chat as well shared that um, they set a timer that every four hours they have to get up and do a stretch or a walk. That's fantastic. Actually, as you're all at home watching this, go ahead and stretch too, or, or look away from the screen for a moment to rest your eyes. Um, we, have, we, have, we have some suggestions too that we can share. So creating screen-free times and zones, at Common Sense, we're big believers in device-free dinners. I think, again, with the pandemic, it can be tricky with um, what's school time, work time, and all of that, but just making sure you take some times during the day where there's no screen time. Um, we also see in the chat, people are sharing um, that they set specific times, like Someone said they took um, social media off their phone, I think specifically Facebook and Instagram. And then during the day, they'll set specific times to check it. So they're adding a little bit of friction, making it a little bit harder for themselves. Oh, great. And we've got that as our suggestion too. Oh, and that autoplay and in-app purchases. This is a great one to highlight with your students too. I know when I talk about this, both with my students and my kids, they can't even imagine um, 
a reality where you don't have the next show coming on right afterwards. It blows their mind that I had to wait a week growing up for the next show. But you know, you can start talking to them also about why you have autoplay and what kinds of behaviors that's encouraging and do they like it and getting them to check in with themselves. Um, and yes, of course, going grayscale is fantastic. That's um, where you change the colors on your phone. I can't really show you with mine right now, but it makes your phone way less appealing for yourself, I would say. And if you have children, it'll make it less appealing. Great, Great. thanks, Tali. And then looking at another strategy um, for encouraging social emotional well-being with our students is just to connect with others, especially now it's so important, right? To encourage building those relationships and keeping those connections. And in our topic on relationships and communication, we have students reflect on the power of their words and actions and how they may act or present themselves differently when they're in person versus a digital environment. And just to show you a, a little bit of a progression of the skills and um, habits of mind that we're building in our lessons, it starts off really early. So in second grade or early elementary, students are starting to think about, well, what makes up a digital community, right? And who is in that um, digital community or who might be in their digital communities? And then as we go into middle school, students are um, reflecting on the positive and negative effects social media can have on their relationships. They're starting to recognize things we call red flag feelings or when they're starting to feel like uncomfortable or just, you know, they might have some kind of like anxiety um, and when they're using social media or when they're online and they're going through that similar thinking routine we went through earlier, feelings and options, where they think about um, different ways of handling those feelings. Um, and then finally for high school, they're thinking about how to communicate effectively, whether they're digital or they're face-to-face -face and how they differ um, and how to make communication more effective to connect with their intended audiences, right? Um, and this is really important as we're thinking about connecting in our remote classrooms um, and just applying that idea of code switching um, from using their phones and other devices in and outside of school as well. Absolutely, Barbara. And I, I was just going to say, I appreciate with the middle school lesson you highlighted too, the, the red flag feeling, really helping kids both identify and acknowledge those feelings. Because I think especially in adolescence, it's really easy to try to push aside feelings of doubt or like, mm, something feels funny or off. And we want to validate them and have that and have them explore that so they can make good decisions. Right. And yeah, and just like stopping to reflect for a moment and just think about like, how am I feeling in this scenario? So let's dive into an activity. Um, and we're going to actually dive into an elementary lesson, but this lesson once again could be used um, on any grade level. And Tali, you've had some experience, right? Um, seeing this lesson uh, be modified for uh, middle and high school groups as well. Yeah, particularly as, as we're gonna be talking about different interpretation, I've, I've seen teachers who work um, in special education classrooms or particularly with students who may struggle with face-to-face um, -face communication and how much more complicated that is, that is digitally. And so giving them this opportunity to think about uh, how we interpret different, different words and actions online. Okay, perfect. So let's dive into an example. Um, so Tali is going to be our um, actor or actress this, um, this afternoon. And she, you are going to determine which emoji fits for how she is going to greet us. So Tali, if you could give us a greeting and then if everyone in the chat could pick one of these emojis for how you think Tali is feeling. Hello. Welcome to this workshop. We're seeing a lot of ones and twos. That was my intention <laughs> to be happy and welcoming. Great, and now let's try it again. Hello. Welcome to this workshop. Great. 
Yes, lots of fours. I like the three and a half too that's coming up. And, and I just have to say thank you, Barbara, because um, I've won many acting awards in my imagination. And so this has been very validating. That's awesome. Yeah, I was sharing with Tali yesterday that I only made it to understudy in drama. So that's why Tali took over today, because um, it, you know, it might be a little confusing if I did. Um, but let's talk about now, like, so you saw, you got to see Tali's face, like you saw her body language, you saw her facial expressions. And then you also saw, you also got to hear the tone in her voice. Um, and so that was really helpful in determining how she was feeling. But what if you're just reading it? So let's say, and I'm gonna not read this, I'm just gonna have you look at it. What would you say Tali is feeling or I'm feeling if you were just reading this word on the screen? What does that mean to you? And now, does this change anything? How would it make you feel now if we added a period to the end of this? Right, and how about now? If everything is capitalized. And then finally, what if it's capitalized and it has multiple exclamation marks? Does that change, right? And great, so I see like the first one, people are like, oh, it's just happy, right? The second one is like, maybe it's more formal. Um, and I've heard from a lot of, you know, teens, they say that like, if you add a period to the end of a text or, you know, a word or a sentence, that that like means something totally different, right? And you might be like upset about something and, you know, they, it could be interpreted many different ways. Um, and all caps usually to me either, it depends on the relationship, right? It could mean that like, they're just really excited to say hi to me, but it also could mean um, that they're upset and they're like yelling at me and I'm not attending to their needs fast enough, right? So creating those digital stressors. Um, and then all the exclamation marks a lot of times to me might mean, depending on the context that they're screaming. Um, and so in this lesson, uh, kids are really starting to think about, you know, how things are interpreted differently depending on the person, right? And also what they're carrying into that situation. So if they're already feeling upset and then, or they're a little anxious about a relationship and then they're reading, you know, hello in all caps with exclamation marks, they might think that person is upset with them and yelling at them. Whereas if, um, you know, it's one of their best friends and they just had a really great conversation and they're just really excited about a conversation that they're having and they see that, they might interpret it as like, they're just really pumped up right? And it's just a really fun conversation and way to say hello as well. Mm -hmm. And so in this lesson, it really helps build that empathy, right? And just the capacity to um, empathize with others and what they might, you know, be going through or their own experiences before sending something or responding. So just really thinking about and envisioning those options and impacts um, as they're communicating digitally. That was really great, Barbara. And I, and I also love how you brought in, you know, your high school students and what different punctuation would mean as well. And I think that that's a great activity to ask your students about too. And so really the, the third part, um, as we think about building a, a socially and emotionally responsive classroom is taking that time to reflect, to really think about your actions, to think about, um, what you've been doing well as well and to really take some time to celebrate yourself and to celebrate others and this last activity that we're going to share for today is uh one of my favorites um i think if we go to the next slide um it's from wide open school which is another uh site that common sense has launched um and it's basically um we have a lot of really great supplemental content from 85 plus partners. This is really designed for both educators and families um, in response to school closures to find these great learning opportunities. And so what Barbara's highlighting right now is that there's a bucket, the emotional well-being bucket. And I think it might be helpful. We'll just click on the link really quickly for you to see. So when you go to the top at wideopenschool.org, you're just going to go to this took us immediately to emotional well-being. And if you scroll up a little bit, Barbara, just for folks to see if you click on student activities, there's then a bucket 
that you can click on that says emotional well being, and that's where you can access all of these great free resources from different partners. And the activity that we're going to do today is um, from one of my favorite authors, actually. It's um, from Jason Reynolds, who's a, a, a YA author, and this is from the Library of Congress. And so we're going to go ahead and play this video and then we'll do the activity. Great. And before we play, the purpose of this activity is really to um, like hone in on that celebration is intentional. And with, you know, having a good social emotional well being, it's really important that we highlight our wins um, during this and really just give us some perspective. Um, so here we go. Hello, 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 say, 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 what's good, what's good, what's good, Jason Reynolds. Uh, welcome back to another edition of Right, Right, Right. All right, so this thing is the National Ambassador of Young People Literature Medal. Boom, there it is. It's my jewelry, you know what I mean? I don't wear it very often, but this is my jewelry. And the reality is, is that they gave this to me uh, basically because... I love children, I love young people. And they were like, yo, this dude loves young people so much, he deserves an honor, right? We should give him a position where his job, a national position, is just to love on young people, uh, especially as it pertains to literature. I mean, that's technically what it's about. So today, what I want y'all to do is make up an award for yourself, an honor for yourself, make up a medal, right? Now, it can't actually exist in real life yet. Right? So you can't be like, yo, I got like a, uh, Pulitzer Prize, I got a Nobel Peace Prize, but we know that that already exists, but you get to make up your own award and you are given that award. And what I need you to do is figure out what the award is, what it's called, what's the criteria to receive this award and why you feel like you deserve to get one. Make up your own jewelry, your own award, your own honor uh, and, and see what you come up with. Me, I'm probably gonna make up a new one. Like, yo, I get some kind of award for being the best like couch napper. I'm nice on a couch. I'm like the illest couch napper ever. Bed sleeper, uh, but couch napper, yo, you're looking at the king, you feel me? So do that and uh, let me know how it goes and I'll see y'all next time. Oh, and by the way, tell your brother I need my sneakers back. I'm gonna holler at you, peace. Hey, thanks. And, and as Barbara was highlighting as well, you know, this is a really great activity. What we're gonna ask you to do right now is think about what award you would give to yourself. And this is fun. Um, we'll share some examples in a moment, but it's also really nice because we're gonna ask you to share with each other too. So again, building on that perspective taking and being able to appreciate others and what they're doing too. So I think um, I may have shared this with you already, Barbara, but I, I gave myself the award for calm in the face of contamination. I'm based in New York and really at the height of the pandemic uh, in April, I went to the park and my younger daughter picked up a chapstick and applied it from the park and I, I stayed relatively calm. So that, that's my award. How about you? What, what's your award? That you deserve an award for that. So congratulations, Tali. Uh, for me, I put I can leave at least one cookie in the bag award. I'm still thinking about the cookie but I can leave at least one cookie in the bag. So I gave myself that award um, and that is really relevant this week because it's been a busy week and cookies have been my friend. So, um, and you can see some of the other awards that have been shared um, with us. Uh, the Business Shrimp Award just makes me laugh every time I see it. Um, but hopefully you're creating an award for yourself and celebrating yourself um, in the small ways as we end today's session. And you can also feel free to share any awards you wanna give yourself in the chat as well. Great. And, and I really love this activity with students because I think it gives them a chance to be silly and creative and also to be proud of themselves and also to acknowledge something silly and creative um, and special about their peers too. Okay. And so now we are going to stop for any questions and we can 
probably stop the recording as well.